Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this, the 34th PMI Friday webinar, the last of the year and, dare I say it, Christmas special. How to Lie with Statistics with Dennis Cromantine Marsh. Now, for those of you who've not had the pleasure of seeing my colleague Dennis in his Christmas D-Mob happy mode, uh, boy, are you in for a treat. Um, so, my name is Rich Seddon, uh, and I'll be facilitating today's session, which includes running the Q&A desk, uh, which we'll be using throughout the presentation. Uh, the Q&A and chat buttons can be found in your Zoom control panel. Please do keep your questions, comments, and observations coming, and I'll put them to Dennis as we go forward. As usual, today's webinar is being recorded, and we'll send you a link via email early next week to the full recording of both the audio and the presentations. And also, as usual, we're broadcasting live on Facebook and LinkedIn. To those of you joining us on the live streams, welcome. Uh, to participate in polls, receive the recordings and emails and make suggestions for future webinar topics, uh, do register at pmi.co.uk forward slash webinars. I am delighted that the January schedule is up and available. Uh, we're powering on ahead into next year and we'll show you some more details of that later on. Before I hand over to Dennis, uh, I'd like to share with you a short video. Uh, that we have put together for our virtual staff conference next week. When I saw the results, the finished results, I simply couldn't miss the opportunity to share this with us. So please indulge me for a moment while we share this with you. So, thank you, Rich, for that. And um, Welcome to everybody here uh, for joining us today, I say. Uh, my name is Dennis Clementine Marsh. I'm a director consultant with PMI and also head of data analytics and insight, which of course is the topic for today. So today uh, we're going to talk about more or less eight to 10 topics about Christmas, plus minus one. Um, so we're going to talk about lying statistics, uh, primary school maths and ordinal data, cherry picking, tempering, higher or lower, if you remember Bruce Forsyth, what do you mean, what's the mean? How big? And if this is the answer, what's the question? And does correlation always equal causation? And I'll finish off with some hints and tips. So that is the first part uh, of the introduction. And uh, let's just move to some newspaper articles. I'm sure that at the moment in the media, you see lots of statistics being banded about and they're more or less accurate. So. Is average house price a useful number? Huh? Average house price in England, 256,000 pounds. But is that the truth? How much has GDP gone up? In the US, it's gone up by 33% in the last quarter. Is that the truth though? The police, the wonderful force, but sometimes they also like to play games, especially when it comes to numbers and targets. And they do something called game playing, at least in some elements uh, of the force. Our customers really are satisfied. I'm sure in your organizations, you have happiness surveys, internal or external. But are they telling the truth or are they potentially misleading? Correlation, causation. I'm sure you're now out about uh, doing some sales for Christmas. And guess what they found? There's a relationship between the temperature and the sales. So therefore, does cold weather mean more sales or not? And the last one, I'm sure you may have seen this in the newspaper as well recently, that um, a person in Florida got actually um, the house got entered if she was trying to share the truth around some COVID statistics. So we have all these things going on in the media. So if we move on from this, then why do people like statistics? And if you're on Facebook, fake book, as I tend to call it these days, yeah, a large percentage of the population believes that actually every day you will find somewhere some fake news. And of course, the question is, why are people doing that? And there's a number of reasons behind it. Could be just in unconscious incompetence. They just don't know better. Or is it poor training? It could also be malice. Political reasons why people do not chose, choose to, to show the truth statistics. Or, of course, fear. There's a fear element there. And to quote Brian Joyner, there's three ways to get better figures. One, distort the system. Two, improve the system. And three, distort the figures, of course, in a, in a different order. And of course, Dilbert, as always, gets it spot on. Huh? In this case, he says, I didn't have any accurate numbers, so I just made this one up. 
studies have shown that accurate numbers aren't any more useful than the ones you make up. And then the question is, how many studies show that? 87. Trust me, I tell you the truth. Now, the trouble with lies is they always have something in common. The best lies anyway. They're often the truth. But the trouble, of course, is they're not always the whole truth. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind when I go through the sections in this uh, webinar today, that actually they're not wrong per se, but they're not the whole truth. And therefore we, we term them, actually they're a bit of a lie. So I'm gonna show you typical lies. I'm gonna show you why they are lies and then also how to counter them. And then I want you to consider three areas in that journey. How is the data collected? How is it analyzed and how is it reported? So before we do that, uh, I'm going to show you a quick poll. I would like you to tell me something about your reporting at work. So either you trust the reports you share or two, I'm sometimes unsure about the data quality in our reports. Three, I know we have challenges with the data quality in our reports or four, actually to tell you the truth mate, between us on this webinar, I don't trust the data at all in our reports. Okay, so I can see the uh, the polling has launched and people are responding. I will just give you a minute to get your responses in here. I'm going to avoid, in the interest of balanced reporting and statistical accuracy, I'm going to resist giving a live commentary on uh, the percentages because I don't want to influence the result. The irony of doing so in this webinar titled like this is not lost on me. Okay, just 10 more seconds on that. Thank you. I can see everyone's getting their votes in there. I was about to say an extremely high response rate here. There's obviously everyone paying attention here, Dennis, but I do not have previous week's data in front of me. So that could well be construed as a falsification. Okay, uh, so thanks folks. I'm gonna end polling now and see what we've got and I'll share those results with you. There we go. So Dennis, we have 48% uh, of respondents saying, I know we have challenges with data quality in our reports. Yeah. Um, and following that up, I'm sometimes unsure. I mean, that's what strikes me about that, the two middle options being uh, kind of balanced and in the lead is uh, great. Um, we're not dealing with deep, deep level of cynicism here. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, your, your thoughts on that, Dennis? I absolutely agree with you here, Rich. Um, so um, this was what I had predicted. Um, it's always interesting to see how much people are in the I trust them fully or actually I don't trust at all, which are a small proportion of today's uh, attendees. Um, so yes, I'm sure you're all trying your best. And that's of course the things, we write reports every day. We do our best, um, but hopefully after this hour, uh, you know how to do it even better. And so that's what it's all about. So yes, thanks um, for that, folks. I'll continue with the first topic. So the first topic of today, you see my little uh, guidance in the right bottom corner of the, each time these, these feeder slides. We're going to talk about primary school maths and all in all data. Now, do you remember the good old days of having a dinner party, uh, a festive board and the like? And, you know, you have to come dine with me. And people are asked to rate the food using smiley faces. And if you want to think about customer feedback at work, the same concept. Now you are tasked to report the results of the dinner party. And here we go. We have something called a Likert scale. So we use a different grades, in this case, smileys. And the smileys are yuck, meh, good, or awesome. And in this case, the results come, come back. I've got one times yuck, nobody thinks meh, two times think good, good, and one person thinks it's awesome. So how much do people like my food? Now clearly I can make up a little acronym. You go, go, or. The question is, what does that mean to people? So you know what? I'm going to be clever. I'm going to convert these smileys, first of all, into numbers, and then I'm going to average the numbers. So let's go. So let's say that yuck is one, Mass two, good is three, and awesome is four. I can do the simple calculation, one times one, zero times two, 
2 times 3, 1 times 4 equals 11. And I'll divide that by the total number of attendees, and I get a result of 2.75 out of 4. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? The question is, however, now I'm going to put a target on this. And the target I'm going to set myself, I want to improve from 2.75 to 3. I'm sure you recognize that from work. But hang on a minute. How much effort is needed to go from good to awesome versus from yuck to meh? And I'm sure you agree with me. To actually go from something really bad to something half good, that's quite quick to do. But to go from something that's really good to something that's immensely awesome is much harder work. So the question is, is the distance in terms of the effort between these four states equal? And the answer is invariably no. So if the distances are not equal and unknowable often, can you calculate an average? So now we've got some challenges with ordinal data. And here they are. Ordinal data, the word ordinal means order. It only tells you if one state is larger or smaller than the other state. It does not imply equal distance between those states. So therefore, I'm very sorry to say, you cannot add up, you cannot subtract, multiply, or divide. That means you cannot average ordinal data. Now, I'm sure when you have been doing some online shopping, Google reviews, Amazon TripAdvisor, other um, websites are available, yeah? Customer feedback or happy surveys. We use this averaging all the time. And just because we use it all the time doesn't mean it becomes truth. So how do you deal with it? Now, first of all, first thing to do, create a histogram. And then identify the percentage in each category as a part of the whole. Identify, for example, on this Likert scale of four, what's in the top two categories? And then you set a target of the percentage in those top two categories you want to achieve. But whatever you do, do not divide. So on the right-hand side, therefore, you see the picture, the histogram linked to the, uh, the dinner party. Three out of four means 75% in the top two categories. My next target for my next dinner party is 100% in the top two categories. And that's how you deal effectively and clean with ordinal data. And I'll still able to set a target and set a good, tell a good story. So that's the first little lie that you may come across. So let's now move to lie number two. What do you mean? What's the mean? Now here's two uh, funny stories. Uh, the first and the left one is a joke. The one on the right is a, uh, is a truth that I've heard about. So a statistician can have his head in the oven and his feet and eyes, and he'll say on average, I'm fine. The one on the right, huh? a newly elected Minister of Education said, did you know that under the previous government, 50% of the children ranked below average in reading, writing, and arithmetic? Under my government, we shall endeavor to get all the children above average. I'm sure you spotted the flaw already in that one. So let's do some line with averages. And you, know, you reflect on these examples if you've seen these in your own reporting. So the average cost of a house in England, 265,000 pounds. Average IT incident closeout rate within four days, 95%. Average depth of water in Holland, two meters. Average income in England, 36,000 pounds, give or take 100 pounds. Our average on-time delivery is 98%. They all sound fine, don't they? But let's go a bit deeper. First of all, there's three different ways of calculating an average. Here's a small data set of 10 numbers, and we can calculate the mean, the median, and the mode. So here we've got challenge number one. When I say average, what did I mean? Now, the mean, of course, is what's called the balance point in a data set. And for this particular data set, it's 4.6. Now, a mean as a calculation is very sensitive to extreme values. So if that 12, you see there's a second point, was 120, you would see that mean shifting way to the right. So they've come up with another way of then dealing with this, which is called the median. The median is called the middle number. You order all the data from low to high, and you choose then the number in the middle. 
So this is very useful when you have what's called skewed data, so it's not symmetrical. The benefit of the median is it's less sensitive to extreme values. In this case, with this data set, the median is five. Or mode, mode is the most common number. You just count those numbers which are the most common. In this case, we see it's either one or five, both appearing twice. Therefore, it's called bimodal. And um, this has got a real interesting challenge that it only works really well with whole numbers. So what should we use? Now, here's the three, def therefore the three lies we can do with averages. I can use an average, of course, to hide extremes. Just use the mean or the median. I hide the extremes in my data. Or line number two, if the most common number, the mode, is close to what I like the answer to be, I'm going to choose the mode. I'll report on that one. Or line number three, data heavily skewed. And I want to show a number which actually is not quite representative for the majority of the population. I use the mean. So here are the steps to take, how to deal with the live using averages. Again, create a histogram. You look at the shape, center, and spread of the data, and you ask yourself the question, is it left skewed? Is it right skewed? Is it symmetrical? Or is the data perhaps bimodal? Add two camel humps in the data, which may indicate there's two populations. What you then do is you calculate both the mean and the median average, and you figure out, are they close together or not? And that will give you an indication about symmetry and skewness. And by the way, always remember, what was actually the question I was trying to answer? So what would you then share in your report on the right-hand side, the histogram, the average value, which always most usefully represents where the majority of the population sits, because that's what you're actually interested in when you report averages. And then, of course, the so what. Had a golden critical question. So what? Did I answer the question? So if you now go back to those uh, five elements I showed you at the beginning of the section, the trouble with this one was they included London prices. And we know in England, at least, that London prices massively skew the average house prices across England. No matter how good 95% is in four days, 5% were actually waiting for more than a year. How happy were those customers? The depth of water could have been as shallow as one centimeter or as deep as 40 meters. So just be careful where you dive. Huh? The wealth, how rich? Actually, in this case, they quoted the mean income rather than the median. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute about this. And on-time delivery, I know it's 95%, but actually what we didn't tell you is it was not in full. We also included part deliveries as successful. So again, we didn't quite tell you the truth. So here's a beautiful histogram. You First of all, you can see the minimum and the maximum, so the range. This case, for this data set from the Office of National Statistics, between zero pounds and 80,000 pounds, they looked at. And they had a mean of the 35,900. But the median, the, where the majority of the population actually sits, is lower than that. In this case, around the 30,000 pound mark, which is a 20% difference. So by choosing what you present, you can actually massively influence how people respond to the result. So that is how you lie with averages. I'm now gonna move on to cherry picking. Again, another favorite, and uh, we've seen it also in the recent COVID statistics. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about election in a different country on the other side of the sea, but there was, again, some accusations of cherry picking there. And first of all, what does cherry picking mean? It's a deliberate use of data which confirms your view and it often ignores relevant or disconfirming evidence. So what you do is you put your blinkers on. Now, I've used two classic examples. One is about the uh, global temperature. In red, you see a very small frame. And then of course, you see the total story which goes back to the 1880s. And at the bottom, you see the British pound versus euros exchange rates and again, depending which section of this data you use, you tell a completely different story. So at the moment, the exchange rate is about uh, one euro, 11, four pounds. And if I looked one month ago, that's fine. But if I look a year ago, it could have been 120. I look five years ago, 113. Or if I go back way back when, 
was 167. So again, depending on the data set I choose and how I select my frame, I can influence what I'm reporting. Now you may recognize these, you know, you've lost some weight after some strenuous exercise. Actually, I lost water, but I know I'll replenish it within 24 hours, but I'm not gonna focus on that. I lost two kilos, yeah? I don't wanna report any bad news today. So what I'm gonna do, I know I had some outliers, but they were definitely positively different. So we just deleted them. Shh, yeah, quiet. Fever, what fever? Now, I take my temperature in the morning three times with one of these remote temperature measurement devices. And I choose the one which is the closest to what is acceptable because I don't want to be found out that actually I've got a fever. Or actually, I don't like the answer I've been given by the data. So I only use those data which correspond with my pre-held conclusion. Um, if you have at work lots of different databases, which, you know, of course, in the digitalization is increasing, you may have two databases with the same naming in it and similar ways of being populated, but one shows a cash flow down at 23%, the other database shows it down at 15%. And you know what? I don't want to share too much bad news. I'm going to choose database B. So what should I do about this? Critical thinking is key whenever data is presented to you. So first of all, always ask for the whole data set. And linked to that, back to the database gaming, was there more than one source of data? Look at the analysis. How did they calculate the answer? What was the question they were trying to answer as well? Always go back to that. Where was the data sampled? Do you trust the source? And finally, what were the credentials of the people, the team, or the method, if it's an RPA system, um, was it verified? Now, here's quite a brutal one, and it's quite uncomfortable, but you may have come across people who feel that their opinions were as much expert view. Now, again, I want to be careful with my statements here. This is not about setting up too much of a, an issue here, but however, if you disagree with an expert on the outcome in a field of study in which you are not an expert, the chances are very high you're wrong. So we need to become comfortable to trust experts in their fields. We can still challenge them based on the left-hand side, but at the end of the day, uh, trust the expert. So if you now go back to these five cherry picking events, here's the answer, of course, track your weight over a longer period of time. And of course, if you use something like Strava, I know there's a beautiful gentleman called uh, Paul at the moment listening to this, who cycled about 250 days, he can track over a longer period of time. No bad news today. So keep the outliers. We can actually learn from the outliers. Do not ignore them. They may give an indication that something is broken in the process, or maybe that something unusually good happened. What can we learn from it? If you have a measurement system, do a measurement system study, and that will be the topic of another webinar next year. If you don't like the answer, the, the challenge will always be remain objective and look for what's called disconfirming evidence. When it comes to databases at work, try to create as much as possible something that one of my lovely clients calls a single database of truth. Single database of truth. So harmonize the data. So at least what you report, you know, at least it cannot be challenged that somebody else found a similar answer. In a different database. So that's the lie of cherry picking. Now, when we move on from the lie of cherry picking, there's also something that I often see in reports, which is called the higher lower game. And we have a, a word for that, it's called tampering. So have a look at this quick video of this A380 landing. got down all right. What you notice, of course, was the swinging, but the swinging was managed such that the plane ended up safely in the middle of the runway. So there was something quite special going on in the method by which this plane was landing, and it was not tampering. So what we're going to look at is again some examples. So this month, sales are up 2.3% based on last month. Yay! success or oh no 
this month is 1.5% lower than the same month last year. So we do a one year by year comparison of a single data point. And just remember that single data point. Boo. Oh, the end of the year has happened. Bonus, here I come. Yeah, we're above the targets at the beginning of the year. Time to celebrate. Oh, oh no, stress. We've got one more month. Just complete all these sales. We start to panic. And by the way, your boss is just demanding that in the next 24 hours, they have a report on their desk, what are you going to do about it? So those are some of the challenges with the higher lower game. So here's again some lies. So line number one, if you do a single point comparison, that's line number one. Line number two, people not understanding the concept of variation. Or line number three, even if they do understand that things vary, they may not understand the difference between what we call common cause variation and assignable cause variation. So what's just normal and what's unusual? Now here's something that often gets ignored in reports. A number's higher than something else and they think that's special. Actually, no, variation is normal. Everything in life varies. But the question is, what's that variation trying to tell us? And a build on that, is the variation significant? Back to the so what question. So what do we do about this? We use control charts. Statistical process control charts, they've got different names. But basically what you do is you plot your data and you plot all the available data. You learn from all the data, not just a single data point. You use, of course, the most appropriate control chart based on the question and the data you've collected. And you apply correctly. And by the way, if there's any black belts on here, yeah, you're not immune to this. A wagging finger comes out. Yeah? Apply the learning and the operating phases correctly to that, please. Apply then the Western electric detection rules. There's two examples on the right-hand side. Identify root causes and carefully apply recalculation rules. And with all these things, apply, of course, careful interpretation. So keep using that gray matter. So if you now go back to this higher lower game, we did a control chart on the sales and actually it says normal variation, don't panic. It was a bit lower, we did a control chart again, normal variation, don't panic. The bonus control chart says normal variation, don't panic. Guess what? It was lower, don't panic. Now there's one caveat to this, which is called containment. It may be that whatever is this thing you're looking at in terms of the, the common cause variation, it may be out of specification. Now, of course, if that's safety critical, if it's mission critical, you may need to take immediate action to protect the customer. So I do not say ignore it, but take the right action based on your decision-making processes. Now, hang on a minute. What about targets? Because you may have at work some targets. What should you do now? So you do not use your run chart and a target line. You do not use a control chart and you plot on there a spec line. What you do is use something called capability analysis. Capability analysis, you see an example on the right hand side, is just a shape of all the data that you've collected. And the shape of all the data you now compare with the voice of the customer the specification, the target, be it internal or external. And that, of course, avoids the tampering with single data points and the stress that that can ensue. Of course, if the process is still too wide, you improve the whole process, not just the one data point. And as I said with everything, use that gray matter and careful interpretation. So that's what you do about dealing with the lie of the higher lower game. Next one, we're going to talk about how big. I mean, sensational newspaper articles, or you may have them at the end of the year as well. Did you realize that we did something absolutely amazing, incredible? And I'm not, by the way, critiquing good news stories. That's not what it's about. I just want to have a bigger look, uh, a closer look at the values that people report on. So you report, we had a huge cycle time reduction on a process. We improved the cycle time of this process step by 200% or you had a massive investment program. In this case, we spent 66 million on proving the warehousing, the data systems, you name it. Yeah. We had amazing on-time delivery. 
it's now this year we've made, managed to improve it to 86%. Fantastic, yeah. Or we only had two failures. So back to critical thinking. How big is that number? The number I just quoted at you, how big is it really? What's the impact of that number? What is it in relationship to the bigger picture within which you're operating within your organization? And always look also at the unit of measure in real terms. So what does that unit of measure actually mean within our world? And then last question, that number you just quoted, was that normal or unusual variation? The last thing I always do, especially with big numbers, I try to bring them back to numbers I can count on two hands and two feet, especially a number that I can make smaller than 100, because I can get my hands, my head, my head and hands around that. If the number comes too big, I, I, I don't know how to deal with it, how to you know, sense it. So I want to relate to the number I report so I can visualize it and therefore I can bring it to life. So here we are again, back to these four examples. Now the first one, it was the truth. However, it was a very tiny, tiny process step, which was only half percent of the overall lead time. So 200% actually resulted in a 2% of overall lead time improvement. Two and a hundred, honestly, not that much significant in the grand scheme of things. There were bigger fish to fry I could have reported on, but perhaps chose not to because it didn't improve those. Or the warehousing one. For this particular organization, the warehousing budget actually is a 700 million pounds. You have a thousand warehouses. So that means 66,000 pounds per warehouse. On average, the warehouse is 5,000 square meters. So that results in 13 pounds per square meter. Does that still sound big to you? Perhaps not. 86% on time delivery, that means 14% on time. This company uh, delivers 8,000 items per month. Every customer on average two items per month. So 40% means 1,100 items are late. That means 560 customers every month are dissatisfied. Is that acceptable to your organization? And the last one, now this actually is a good news story. There were 2 million potential failures and we only had two failures. That's one in a million. Now for those who know how to calculate a six sigma value on something, a sigma value, that is honestly as close to what's you know, about six sigma, give or take. Huh? That actually is very, very small. That's a good news story. So if somebody presents a number to you, always think that question, how big? Next line that I uncover is, if this is the answer, what's the question? Now, I'm sure you've seen this number before, if you like uh, British uh, science fiction, huh? the answer, the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, of course, is 42. And then the book or in the film, if you watch it, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it always comes back to that. What was the question again we we're trying to answer? So here again, we have an on-time delivery of 99.5%. Well, hey, sounds like party time to me. Or can I trust the data? Did you know that 76.3% of all statistics are made up? Well, the question is, how precise is your answer? And I give you the answer, and the quality is 78.6545% correct. Wow, that sounds impressive. Or, you know, back to, uh, to the waxing of moustaches or beards or other hair products. Eight out of 10 people agree this amazing hair product really works well for managing snazzy moustaches because uh, you're worth it. The problem number one, of course, is I gave you an answer. It actually is not the answer to your question. It just sounds like a really good number. Or number two, the number's just made up. On the third one, just because it has decimal places does not mean it's accurate and true. And in this case, the eight of 10 people, it happened to be that in my office there were only 10 people available when I asked them the question. And I stuffed their faces full with cake. And I said, was it good? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's the answer I wrote down. 
And you may see it on TV commercials. I always put it at the bottom there. So how do you deal with it? What's the question? Back to the critical uh, thinking on the left-hand side. Make sure the question is formulated clearly and ensure that the people who come up with the answer understand the wording in the question. So when you said on time, what do you mean by on time? When you said how precise, what did you mean by how precise? Then verify that the answer actually answers the question. What's the correct analysis based on the type of data? Which analysis is correct to answer the question? Now, if you go into the black belt, of course, you know, hypothesis testing, parametric, non-parametric, you can come up with different answers. I see sometimes people using regression where they should have used hypothesis testing, et cetera. And then the last one there, highlight the areas you're not sure about, either risks or the assumptions. Make sure people understand what was the frame within which you were operating. Now on the right-hand side, some of them are a little bit more geeky and they will be get covered uh, again in New Year about sampling strategies. And it's things like confidence interval, p-value, beta risk, power size and sample. So we can get some confidence. Was this enough data? Because the golden question always is whenever you're sampling data, is a representative for my population? And if the answers are not sure, collect more data. Which sampling method did you use? Was it random? Was it structured? Uh, was it mechanical, etc.? Where did the data come from? Did you buy it? Did somebody else collect it? So can you trust it? And the last point in here, of course, plan, do, study, act. Keep learning, keep refining that sampling strategy until you get that confidence. Yes, this data I've got is representing the population and it's helpful to answer the question. Uh, you see now in all the COVID tests they do, huh? they keep learning and evolving in that. So that is the uh, lie of not truly answering the question. We now move to the last slide I want to share with you all. And uh, this is about correlation. Does it equal causation? Now, there's a beautiful website called tileofvegan.com, and I encourage you to go and have a look at it. Or you may also remember a book uh, by Stephen J. Covey, uh, which is called Freakonomics. And, and on BBC4, there's one program called More or Less. And a lot of times what they do is they talk about correlation and causation. So what we see here, for example, a bit of a funny one, that they realized that the number of people that died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets was correlating very, very strongly with how much cheese was consumed per capita. And on the left-hand side, the unit of measure, that's in uh, imperial measures, you know, people on the continent, that's, uh, you know, it's uh, that old school thing, yeah. And on the right-hand side, we see the deaths. Now, the question, of course, is should I now set a target that we need to get rid of bed sheets? Because clearly, bed sheets are causing increase in cheese consumption. Or is the other way around? Should we ban people from eating cheese? Because that clearly is indicating that less people can become tangled in the bed sheets. So I can interpret this graph in many different ways. All of them, of course, nonsense. But they tell a good story. So, how do you allow correlations? First of all, we ignore process knowledge. There's a very classic experiment. It's amazing, the Hawthorne experiment. And there's a difference in interpretation by sociologists versus statisticians. But what they found, they made lots of changes and it all caused improvement in productivity. So what was going on there? The lurking variable. There's something out there. Classic one again, ice cream sales cause increase in murder. So we should stop ice cream sales. Correlation does not equal causation. You will see publications say the R square, this thing is 95%. It's a great result. Or fishing. I've just created so many explanatory variables, in this case, 23, which uh, a, another client a long time ago did. And they finally got a good correlation. Just add more things in there. The last one, influencing. Uh, where they use, in this case, it was about, I have used eight height and age to predict weight. So what's going on here then? The first one, we link the outcome, the response to a driver, an explanatory variable, which is not significant. So I can artificially increase the result. 
the lurking variable. Very often what I see here is that we actually have two explanatory variables on the X and the Y axis, rather than an explanatory and a response variable. So we need to actively look, which is the right explanatory variable? Just because there's a, a good R squared does not mean there's causation. Although I, I, I will agree with you, 95% that ain't bad. And we give some ranges for what is considered to be not a bad R squared value. Increasing the number of variables until you get your desired co correlation, huh? that's called fishing. And the last one is use heavily correlated expansion variables. Therefore, I can, I, I can influence the result I get out of the calculation. So how do we deal with this? Number one, process knowledge is key. So causation cannot be proven using statistic. Correlation is the only one that actually uh, uh, is a calculation, but causation, there's no statistic for that. So you need to study the process. Um, back to this third point there, expansion variables. Is it actually a response variable? So just be clear on what you chose to collect the data on. The next one, keep the model as simple as possible. For every factor you include in your model, it's about a 5% increase in risk. So if you have 23 variables, no idea what you're measuring anymore. And then, of course, that last one, the lurking variable, and you will see a little picture on the right-hand side. So keep looking for that. Yeah, in this case, popcorn consumption seems to be related to traffic acid accidents. So but actually they're both linked to population. So those are some of the lies. And when I wrote this thing, I thought, crikey, I could read, write another hour on this. I could actually write another day on this topic. So I'll give you some hints and tips to, to close out for today. So first of all. Dennis, just before, Dennis, yeah. sorry, just before you okay. go onto that, can I uh, fire a couple of questions for you? Sure. Hockey dogs. So uh, two questions on the desk. Uh, one from one of our regular contributors, Moses. Um, of all the aspects slash lies that you mentioned, which do you see most often in your practice? Oh. Uh, most often is a difficult one to say. Um, I think the one that strikes me the most is probably the one around variation. That uh, people um expect numbers to be the truth and don't realize that just because a number is slightly different um it's good or bad and that's not the case so i think probably if i had to choose one which is actually the one i, I always try to make a point of whenever i work with clients is to understand the variation in their processes but that can be okay. a very long journey yeah for them to go from where they are today to actually be uh ready to listen to that discussion and that, 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 that um, did you know that? Okay, great. Um, and one from Charlotte here. Um, understanding the process by which the data is collected is, in my experience, as important as the analysis and manipulation. Do you agree? Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, if it's subjective data, you know, the way you ask the question can influence the results. Huh? So do I agree with the question which asked? He said, do you agree? Of course, yes. He says, agree, I must agree. Um, the process by which we collect is critical. And whether it's using humans or whether it's using systems, we need, absolutely Charlotte, we need to understand how the data is collected in the first place. Yes. Great, thanks, Dennis. Yeah. So, um, so, my tribes had a beautiful statement, and I absolutely love it. It's quite a controversial statement, but it's, it's beautiful at the same time. All models are wrong, but are they useful? And that's the thing I wanted for you to take away from this discussion. Because sometimes the way we display the data is just the best known knowledge we have today. You may be aware it's not perfect, but like I say, tell people, Dan, that you know it's not perfect. So people at least know where you're coming from. So understand where the data came from, how it was sampled, how it was defined. So actually, Charlotte, uh, this, this answers again your question. Top tip, absolutely agree with you. Um, understand how it was analyzed. Sometimes we, we give this to business analysts uh, within our organizations, or we use Excel. Um, 
One of the reasons I, I created a data analysis package is because I realized people were calculating the standard deviation for, for control charts using the standard Excel function equals STDEV. And actually what they should, should have used is the Schuhart calculation of R bar over D2. So always understand how people have analyzed something so you know if it was right or wrong. Understand, understand the underlying assumptions and risks and never assume just because I've quoted a number at you, it must be right. Keep asking those critical questions. And if you're in doubt, just consult an expert. There's plenty of experts in the field and you know, trust them. The reason that's why they're experts. It doesn't mean they're infallible, but very often experts, of course, will learn, they will revise, they will improve. And that I take great strength from that also in the media this year. When I see we got it slightly wrong, we have a better way of displaying the data next, next time. For me, that's not a U-term, that's called learning. And the last one, huh? keep learning, keep finding better ways to collect data, analyze it and seek insights. Rich. That's fantastic, Dennis. Uh, no, it's brilliant. Uh, so a couple of uh, clarifications, I think. A uh, couple we'll do in writing, actually, for those of you who've asked them, they're, they're uh, a bit technical for the explanation <laughs> explanation live, not least because I myself don't understand the question. Mm -hmm. uh, back to Dennis's point. Um, and again, there, I think there seems to be, I'm, and I'm agglomerating several questions together here, Dennis, there, um, there seems, to be, uh, seems to be several around um, looking for your advice mm -hmm. as to uh, uh, the main thing to look out for here um, to, to uh, interpret data better. Sorry to put you on the spot. I know you dodged the question last time. However, your audience demands it of you. Can you just repeat the question again? So... Of all these things you've been talking about today, okay. the top ones to watch out for in your experience. Oh gosh, the ones to look out for. The top ones. Hmm. Think variation, the how big, so it makes sense within the bigger context, the system within which you're operating. Um, That's all male preoccupation, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I will move now on I've thrown it. Just, just me thinking <laughs> um, let me tell you let me answer the question slightly different whenever somebody gives me data the first thing I do I whack it into a run chart just show me what it looks like in a run chart the next thing I do I whack it into a histogram so the shape center and spread once I've done those absolute basics of where does the middle sit, where do the extremes sit, I then create a control chart. Yeah, and if I know the data fairly well, I ignore the run chart, I straight away go to a histogram and control chart. Because I want to see the big picture and only then I'm going to filter with the question, is the data I'm now filtering still useful to answer the question? And that works both for when you have no data or when you have too many data. So in terms of strategy, and throughout that, I keep actually looking at all these things because you need to keep that, the bigger picture, there could be multiple reasons why something is not right. So I'm terribly sorry, sir. It's that big. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, okay great uh, just before we just before we move on dennis uh, just one final point uh, around your uh, from Stas here about your point uh, mentioning experts um and it's 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 the health warning with expertise isn't it uh, and Stas makes the point becoming an expert in inverted commas can be as easy as writing a blog on a topic mm -hmm. does that mean i should trust them absolutely Stas. and i think the the app the application we'd apply is understanding the process great point but if you understand the process you understand the beans by which they are an expert is it, the same thing applies yeah and that does mean also you know, look at their credentials you know, challenge the motives they may have uh, on that as well. Um, be always be critical, yeah. Uh, but don't be critical to the point uh, where it becomes, yeah, becomes um, not not. You know, think about learning. I'll leave it there. Can I learn cool. from this? Is it useful? Is it helping me to answer the question? If not, 
either seek a different expert or go back to them and engage with them. Lots of experts actually enjoy being engaged with. And I don't mean talk with another non-expert on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Dennis. <laughs> Um, any more questions? No, uh, no, that's it for moment. Thank you. Cool. So let's go to the last poll. Bit of a fun poll, slightly lighthearted. So select all that apply in your uh, experience. Huh? So do you think that you are now more comfortable spotting uh, lies between inverted comments within statistics? Is it 42? Is it? What's the question again? Is it, you know what, actually, I would love to come on a longer course with you next year. Or is the answer just... <laughs> yeah, who are they talking about when they say it? It doesn't say they want to come on a course with you. That That's not in the words. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, actually, you, you should come on a course with an expert. Yeah, not with me. I'm not an expert in these things at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, folks. Bit of fun there. Um, so, so what's the verdict? Uh, let's see. Um, oh, good news, Dennis. You are an expert. 44% of your audience say yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. However, 16% say 42. So make of that <laughs> what you will. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thanks, Dennis. Um, if you could just move on to the next slide for me. So, folks, as we said uh, up front, uh, the January schedule is available. Uh, we're absolutely delighted. It's our privilege to host these events for you. Uh, we love having you with us. The feedback you give us is taken very seriously. So please do look out for the Voice of the Customer surveys. Um, mm. As I say, the schedule is up and available. Get yourself booked before you go on your Christmas holidays. Uh, first coming up on the 8th of January is choosing the right improvement approach. And before we uh, close out, thank you very much for myself and Dennis for joining us. We'll leave you with this uh, brief message. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great holiday. And uh, by the way, if you want to talk about your data, just get in touch. Huh? You know where to find us.